So on that note, um, I'll introduce Michelle because um, I think um, what we're going to hear today is I think really um, how we should do it, um, not how I did it. And look, you can read um, about Michelle. I think many of us over our careers have listened or have been lucky to be at a talk by Michelle, one of uh, Australia's most respected uh, uh, and awarded political journalists, member of Canberra par Parliamentary Press, um, um, Press um, Gallery for more than 40 years. And I think you will have heard her on many occasions talk about many of the significant stories in Australia. Former editor of the Canberra Times, first female editor of an Australian daily newspaper. And she's been with the Australian Financial Review, Sydney Morning Herald, political editor of The Age since 2004. She's currently dual role with an academic position at University of Canberra, uh, associate editor and chief political correspondent at The Conversation. And I've been really interested to follow that growth of the conversation over time. Um, author, co-author, editor, several books, and an officer of the Order of Australia in 2004 for her uh, long service and distinguished service to Australian journalism. So we're just so excited to have Michelle here. Um, I'm hoping we're gonna have a pretty interactive audience for you. Um, they're excited and I think that we won't waste time. I'm just going to let Michelle get up and give her presentation. No PowerPoint, no death by PowerPoint today. <laughs> We've got a presentation, she's just going to talk to us. After Michelle's finished, we're going to have um, the Q&A and we'll bring up our other panellists and I'll introduce them to you at that time. Um, but at, at this point in time, we'll just welcome Michelle to the stage or to the podium to give you a presentation. Thanks, Michelle. Well, thank you very much. After that introduction, I'm tempted to say I'm here to help. <laughs> But uh, it's really good to be here in uh, Newcastle. I haven't spent much time in this city, but uh, I wish I was here for more than uh, just uh, less than 24 hours. But uh, your campus uh, looks a great place to, uh, to work. Now, um, I want just to start with uh, talking very briefly about the, uh, the landscape for uh, people who are trying to get into the media from uh, academia. And I think it presents both opportunities and limitations for researchers who want to put their material forward more generally. First, the opportunities. If you take into account uh, new media and social media, there are many more media outlets today uh, than ever before and that obviously presents you with a lot of scope and, and quite a lot of uh, diversity in getting your uh, material and messages out. Secondly, newspapers these days have fewer rounds people than in the past and this is because of the general collapse of the business model of newspapers and other factors. So if they want specialist material they very often may have to go outside. Third, the 24-hour news stations such as Sky and ABC, ABC 24, need a lot of uh, content. And this often presents the chance for people who've got something to say on issues or have uh, research or things out or whatever to uh, get into the media that way. Fourth, radio in the form of the ABC presents a channel for getting some research out, especially if you've got a, a, a new piece of work, a book, an article, whatever. Uh, the various talk shows are always uh, looking for people and, and you, you hear researchers over a wide range of uh, areas uh, appearing on them and uh, of course the ABC has a quite specialised range of programs so it's sort of across the board. And fifth, and I admit this is an advertisement, uh, there's the relatively new channel of The Conversation for which I work which is all about enabling academics to get their uh, material to a general audience. So in that case you've got uh, a site that's, that's really dedicated to your interests and to presenting you in uh, 
a, a good light uh, um, in terms of presenting your material accurately and in a way that you're happy with. Now, on the negative side, newspapers have gone more pop and they do have less interest than once in many series issues. They run shorter articles and, uh, as I was saying, because of the collapse of the business model, uh, they have less money to pay academics who write for them. At least in the case of uh, Sky, um, the TV talk model has come to put much more emphasis on commentary uh, and argument and confrontation these days than in-depth discussion of issues. Although uh, there is still, as I said, room for this in-depth uh, interviews and uh, their move to a more uh, commentary role, indeed a more Fox News role I think in the case of Sky, uh, shouldn't affect your contributions. And finally on the negative side, and this is a fundamental point, we are in a time when many in the general population have come to be suspicious of experts. The, uh, the whole rejection of experts in the community uh, is uh, quite a, um, an interesting and modern trend. People no longer defer to those who are knowledgeable in particular areas to the extent they once did. And this is, I think, a part of a more general revolt against elites. And there's a book which is just out by Tom Nichols, who's a, a professor at the US Naval War College, which is called The Death of Expertise, The Campaign Against Established Knowledge and Why It Matters. And uh, if you can get hold of that, I think that uh, it, it's well worth a look. It's a very interesting book. It also is uh, relevant not just to the general question of uh, the revolt against expertise, but has interesting observations about how this affects universities and education and, and how st students, and you would know this so well, <laughs> students these days have become consumers and clients, and as consumers, they're looking for what they see as value for money, uh, even though they often don't know um, what that value really is because they're not schooled in the, in the things they're learning, as it were. They're, they're not uh, yet knowledgeable enough to know what they need to know. But I recommend that book to you. Now, with those points in mind, how do you go about things? It goes without saying that you need the expertise, you need a product, uh, you need to be a product yourself, as it were, so I'm assuming you have the goods uh, to present to your uh, desired audiences. Now, some sort of research is going to be easier to get into the media than other uh, kinds. If your topic is narrow and of limited relevance and public interest, for example, if you're a specialist on Latin American literature, say, it's going to be a losing battle. Uh, except on the most rare occasion. This doesn't mean the research isn't worthwhile, of course, it just means that uh, really it's not going to um, be of interest to a very wide audience. When you have a piece of research that does have general interest, think about its wider impact, how it affects ordinary people, how it impacts on the economy and the community. Also, what's different or special about it and what can ordinary people take out of it? There's also the question of whether this is going to be a one-off interaction with the media, a, a, a specific piece of data that you're getting out there, or whether you're looking for an ongoing role as a, a specialist on whom journalists and media organisations can regularly call. If it's the former, if you just have one thing, as it were, to put out there, um, you can seek the help, obviously, of your public relations section to put together a, a press release. 
and they should also be able to help you make contacts with relevant media organisations. Now, in dealing with journalists, and the, the story that um, was told earlier is, is very, very relevant here. Always remember, it is your research. So it's important for you and your institution that it comes across accurately. Don't overhype and don't let anyone else overhype. And this, I'm not sure this doesn't apply here, but includes uh, the communication sections of universities as well. In this regard, there was a very salutary lesson in last week's Media Watch about the publicity on work on some anti-aging drug. And if you're interested, you can look up the details on the Media Watch website. Media Watch blamed the journalists for overhyping the story, but they also said that some of the blame for what uh, Media Watch called an excitable media coverage had to be sheeted home to the press release from the University of New South Wales, which boasted, and I quote, UNSW scientists unveil a giant leap for anti-aging. Now, a general audience is different from an expert one and some compromises are often going to be necessary for that reason. You can't just put it out there in all its technical glory and expect uh, Mr and Mrs Newcastle to um, lap this up and, and, and understand that they are, they are not experts. So be realistic, but as much as possible, don't lose control. You have every right to ask journalists to check back with you what they're using of your material and your quotes. You should have got the quotes <laughs> checked back. And indeed, to do your best to insist on this. Now, some journalists will be resistant. They'll say, well, our organisation doesn't do that. But on the whole, you can usually prevail. And it's actually in the journalist's interest to do this, even if they don't recognise it, because if, if I'm writing a story about uh, some scientific uh, thing that one of you uh, is doing, I'm not an expert in the area, I can have good faith, uh, bring good faith to the reporting, but nevertheless, it's easy to make mistakes, and if you don't know what you don't know, uh, you, you fall into all sorts of traps. So. If I was working with you, it, it is certainly in my interest to, to get it right, not to have haggling you know, tears after the event. But from your point of view, it is your reputation. But also remember that you can't completely control things. And once the initial story is out there, it can take it off in all sorts of ways and go in unexpected directions, good and bad but you should try and exert this reasonable control over the initial stage and then be careful to put your later uh, comments uh, when there are follow-ups in context. Now, if you decide to present your research through the conversation, there is uh, a series of checks. Those checks are built into the whole process and this is a very safe space for you. Uh, you have the help of expert editors there. Uh, they will, in many cases, do some uh, rewriting, reworking of your piece, but you have the right for a, a final uh, sign-off. And the, the nature of the site is, is not... It doesn't have to appeal in the same populist way as uh, some other media outlets. So... Uh, it is, from your point of view, uh, a quite um, secure environment where you have a lot of control over things. And the website has details of how all this works. Now, the conversation has a smaller audience than, say, Fairfax Media or um, News Limited outlets, but it does have something more than 2 million unique hits uh, a month and that's, in Aust that's the Australian site. So um, 
the benefits of an initial release there given the, uh, the process which is really working uh, with you and to your advantage. And remember, this is a site primarily funded by the universities, so it's sort of in your possession, as it were. The advantages are obvious. Also, articles can be picked up, and often are, by other outlets, including internationally, which can have all sorts of uh, very obvious spin-offs. When they're republished, too, they can't be tampered with, and this, again, is another uh, very... Um, secure sort of uh, lock on, on the system. As well, other media organisations um, often see the material and contact the academic direct for a story or a comment. 55% of the conversations authors receive media follow-up as a result of writing. Uh, so having an author profile on the conversation is definitely useful. Being on this site obviously potentially puts you in contact too with other academics with similar or related interests and remember that the conversation also has um, fellow sites in various other places, America, uh, the UK, France, Africa, uh, so it, it, there's a wide reach there. If rather than pre presenting a one-off piece of data, you're looking to become an, an ongoing source of information or a commentator or both, you need to establish a presence and a profile. Make sure that you're on the relevant contact lists of both your university and your expert groups uh, in, in your particular discipline. And media people are often in a hurry, so uh, when they're looking for something or someone to comment, they will go to those sorts of places, so you need to be there. Also, if you don't already um, have it already, establish a social media profile using Twitter and Facebook. But be careful what you post and what you say. It's useful to let people know through social media uh, what, you're, what you've written and also to uh, tweet around other works that people might be interested in. So if people are following you, they're not just getting your work or your life, but they see you as someone who directs them to other things that they might be interested in that you've picked up and uh, noted. If you have the time, energy and enough to say, you can also establish a blog. Uh, again, uh, important to uh, keep it respectful if, if it's a sort of in the commentary role and um, if you're looking to advance your career interests as opposed to just blaring about whatever, um, make sure that people know that they go to it and find things that are, are relevant um, to, to that field. Within reasonable limits, be available to the media if you want to have this ongoing role. Now, this might mean putting yourself out, going into a, a studio, uh, but uh, again, it's, it's worth putting in the effort for the result. And um, if, if people will say to you, well, come to the studio, often you sound better with a proper microphone rather than a mobile phone. Uh, if it's television, they may or may not have uh, sort of a makeup person or whatever. But they will. Pre what I'm saying is that if you have the advantage of those sort of basic technical things, you'll come across in the most effective way. So make an effort. Uh, Again, as a regular commentator, it is a matter of accommodating the needs of the media while keeping yourself nice as an academic. Only agree to talk when you have something to say or can get across the matters on which you're commenting. So if you're, uh, say, a general expert in international relations, you may not be completely up with the latest in whatever someone's approaching you to talk about, but if you can actually get yourself up to speed, then that's, uh, that may be uh, 
very adequate, but you need to do that. You, you shouldn't go into those things unprepared. Learn to be concise while not overstating your points. And remember that you might be cut off, because often these are very short interviews, you might be cut off before you can get in necessary qualifications. So get those qualifications in, but only get qualifications that need to be there. Uh, so you don't overload something with qualifications, but you don't uh, present something in a way that is not uh, totally accurate. And it's important to establish contacts in the media. People in your public relations section, again, can help you, or you can make an approach direct. For example, by ringing a specialist who might work, say, um, uh, on health stories and just make a cold call and say, I was interested in what you wrote on this uh, topic today. I do work in this area. If you ever need anyone, um, why don't you give me a call? And again, it's often useful to do that when uh, you're not actually needing something yourself, when you don't need them particularly yourself on that occasion. Um, some people will give you the brush off. Others might think, well, it's useful to know someone in that area. Uh, so um, you, you never know when that sort of contact will um, pay off, but I think it's worth trying. If you're not going on TV, um, uh, sorry, if you are going on TV or radio, polish your interview style. Listen back to any interviews you do and find someone who knows about these things and um, ask them to critique it again. Uh, your communication section should help you in that. It can be a painful process, um, but uh, it's important. Avoid like the plague, uh, things like I mean and you know and those sorts of um, phrases. They, they can be really annoying and it's incredibly easy to fall into them, uh, especially if you're nervous and, and you have to, I think, constantly uh, watch out for them. So never let your thoughts uh, get, uh, never let your words get ahead of your thoughts. Now I'm aware that um, some of this advice is a very long way from your research, but it's important if you want to be someone sought out to comment in the media. And if you think, well, she's just telling me the obvious and I'm operating at a much higher level, think of it this way. However prepared your research paper is, you would not dream of presenting it for publication without making sure that the grammar and the punctuation were okay. And it's really the same in this wider media role. You have the product, you have good things to tell people, but you've just got to attend to some little presentational details that uh, if, if not attended to, can take away from that very good material you have to put forward. One other way of communicating uh, your research, I think, that's well worth using is through the use of podcasts. Um, we've done a, quite a bit of this on the conversation and in Canberra, uh, my researcher produces podcasts and we try and interview a politician or or an expert, we use quite a lot of um, academic experts uh, and we do about one of these a week. And uh, these are increasingly, podcasts in general, are increasingly popular uh, with people uh, because they can listen to them while they do other things, obviously. And it is uh, a way of talking about things uh, and presenting material that uh, opens a lot of um, opportunities. And those can be put up on your university site and they can be distributed to uh, specialist audiences or general audiences or your local media. You, you live in a, uh, an area where you have regional media and this is uh, particularly good for those wanting to uh, get out into the media because uh, that local media tends to present more opportunity for people around 
here than if, if you're competing in the, uh, the broader national media. I'm not saying you shouldn't pitch to the national media, but just remember the, uh, the local media particularly. And uh, I was going to say they might be easier to handle, but uh, the journalist here shouldn't take that the wrong way. But, uh, but because it's, it's community, uh, they <coughs> do present a channel that, um, that, that should be uh, one that you're familiar with and that's familiar with you and that has all sorts of um, advantages. Um, now, on this podcasting, uh, again, the communication section should help you. I'm sorry to uh, heap work on them, but uh, they are experts uh, in those sorts of areas and I'm sure are, are very willing to find new ways of um, uh, getting your material out. Now, those are just some thoughts. Uh, I'm sure you'll have lots of questions, but uh, I'll leave it. For the, uh, for the moment at, at that. Thank you.